All right, now let's go to the book, let's start in the book of Daniel, the eighth chapter. I'm going to try to go through this quickly. Okay, it's 25 after. Daniel, the eighth chapter. And write these verses down so that you can uh, look at them after service if you would like. In the eighth chapter, just reading the first and second verses, <clears throat> the script Daniel's talking about says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was in Shushan, in the province of Elam. Province of Elam. Right, underline that word, Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of uh, Eli. What I want to talk about today is Elam. And I didn't know if Brother Mike was going to be away from the, his father today or not, so I did bring video and pictures. But you can look in the back of your Bible. In the land of Elam, the province of Elam, as it was known then, then at that time, if you look at the Persian Gulf, the land just north of the Persian Gulf and all along the east, northeastern side of the Persian Gulf is the land of Elam, E-L-A-M. <clears throat> if you know, remember in 1991 we had the Kuwaiti War, okay, the first Gulf War. Well, Kuwait, that's all Elam. If you go around, you wrap around the, the uh, Persian Gulf, on the east side for, I don't know, 150 miles, 200 miles, however long, however wide that, that area was, is the ancient country of Elam. So Daniel was in Elam. It was Shushan. It was also a short abbreviation for Shushan called Susa. There's the 11 books of the Apocrypha that took place between the Old and the New Testament. And there's one of those books that deals very, very much with Shushan and the area of Elam. Now, I'm not going to talk about that. So I want you to know about Elam. It is what we would know today as Western Iran. <clears throat> okay, now go with me to the book of Ezra. It says, Rehum, the chancellor, <clears throat> and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem <clears throat> to Artaxerxes, the king, in this sort. And if you read this fourth chapter, the whole fourth chapter deals with this letter that was written to King Artaxerxes, who was the king of the Medo-Persian Empire with like 120 provinces. So they write this letter against the Jews who were rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. What's about ready to take place pretty soon? Then write, then wrote, Rehu, the chancellor, and Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, and it gives the name, the uh, uh, Dionites, and the Arpharsites, and the Telpathites, and the Aparsites, and the Achevites, and the Babylonians, and the Susan, uh, Susanites, those are from Susa, uh, the Dehabites, and the Elamites, and the Elamites, underline Elamites, they're part of that group, who were resisting the temple being built. And it says, and the rest of the nations whom the see, nations, the nation of Elam, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble uh, Asnapur brought over and set in the cities of Samaria, and the rest that are on the side of the river and at such a time. All right, so <clears throat> remember whenever the Assyrians captured Israel. They conquered Israel. And then 70 or so years later, I forget how many years it was, the Babylonians came in and captured. They conquered Jerusalem. They conquered Judah. When the Assyrians came in and captured Israel, which were the northern ten tribes of Israel, they pulled a lot of the Jews out. They took them up to Nineveh, which was the capital, one of the uh, large cities in in. Uh, in uh, the Assyrian Empire, and also the capital city was Ashur, like the, the Assyrians Ashur. And so they took Jews all over their empire, and they brought in people from all of these other countries into Israel. 
And one of the countries that the Assyrians had conquered and took into Israel were the Elamites. And the Elamites were resisting what Ezra was trying to do and the Jews were trying to do. They were trying to rebuild the temple and the Elamites were part of that group that said no and they wrote letters and you can go and read this whole fourth chapter. The whole fourth chapter deals with how they were writing letters and doing everything they could to stop the building of the temple. They even came and they told Ezra and, and the other leaders, they said, you know what, let us help you build this temple. We know that you want to worship your God, so why don't you guys just go out in Jerusalem and go worship your God and we will build this temple for you. And Ezra says, Are, have you lost your mind? We, you have nothing to do with our temple. Get out of this city. We are not allowing you to build our temple. We are Jews. We will build our own temple. Well, the, the Edomites and the others, they didn't like it. And so it, it became more and more of a conflict. And you know what it ended up? The building the temple, building the walls. So what I want to bring out, at that time, these nations that surrounded Israel, all of these nations, they had been brought in by the Assyrians into the land of Israel, and they were all <laughs> resisting trying to stop the Jews from rebuilding the temple. Okay? Let's go to Acts, the second chapter. I'm just laying a foundation now, okay? Over to the New Testament, <clears throat> to the book of Acts, the second chapter. I want to read down through verse 9. It says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rescue mighty man. Actually, we probably don't need to read this. You know the story. Okay? Everybody around about they were amazed when these people from all of these different countries, uh, these people were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. And all of these people from like 18 different countries were there for the Jewish holiday of Pentecost and they saw what was going on. And it says, now when this was the sixth verse, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, thousands of people that came together and were confounded. It's like, how could this be <coughs> how could this <coughs> be taking place? Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these people Galileans? Aren't they from here? How do we hear every man in our own language wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, the dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, all of these different countries. There were Elamites there. So look, it says Parthians and Medes and Elamites. Now remember... The, the uh, Elamites were part of the Persian Empire. The Persians had eventually conquered Elam. You see here it says, remember it says here, Medes and Elamites. Medes, they were part of the Persian Empire too. They were on the far eastern side of the Persian Empire. And the Elamites were on the far western side of the Persian Empire. So that's why there's no act, it's not an accident the two countries of the Medes and the Elamites are listed together because both of them are from the modern day country of Iran which originally Iran was Persian in 1932-33 the ambassador from, from Persia to uh, Germany to the Nazis uh, he, uh, he began listening to the Nazi propaganda and how they hated Jews and so he comes back to Persia to Tehran, capital Persia, he tells them, you know, we are not Arab. We are, we are Caucasians, just like the Germans. And we don't speak Arabic, we speak Farsi because we have our own language. We are Caucasians. And you know, these, these Germans, they've got it right. We need to get involved with the Germans and support them in killing these Jews. So they decided to change their name from Persia to Iran. The name Iran in Farsi means Aryan. We are Aryans just like the Germans. So the name Iran means Aryan. We are Aryans and we hate the Jews just like the Nazis. Okay? 
So <clears throat> Elamites and Medes, these are people from the land, the modern day country of Iran. <clears throat> okay, so, but what, they were witnesses of what God was doing among the Jews. We daily on the news are witnessing to what God is doing among the Jews. Now, well over a third, maybe it's 40 percent now, of all Jewish young people believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Wow. That is unreal. Because everything that the, the, the Catholics in the in the the, the Crusades, what they did, the Pope ordered the Crusades, and they killed over a million. During the Crusades, the Crusaders killed over a million Jews. They went up to Germany, they went all over Europe on their way over to try to conquer the Holy Land, and they killed Jews. They killed Jews. So the Jews look back, and all of this Christian Inquisition, what the Catholics did in Spain, getting rid, trying to get, get rid of the Jews, and, and actually my understanding, and, and uh, is the teaching is that uh, 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 Christopher Columbus was an Italian Jew, and he was on the way, the reason he wanted to go uh, find a new route to India was because of the Inqu Inquisition that had begun in Spain, and he wanted to find a place where the Jews could escape. So he goes to uh, uh, Ferdinand, the king of, and Isabella, the king and queen of Spain, and he asked for three ships, and they were given the need of the pit to Santa Maria to go find a place for the Jews to escape. But that wasn't the plan of God, because God said, no, 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 I'm not going to send them to the new world. I'm going to bring them back home to Israel. And so after the Inquisition, where did the Jews go? They went to Poland and to Ukraine. 400 years ago, after the Inquisition, over half of the Jews in the world lived in the area of Ukraine. Why does the devil, in this war that's going on, why does the devil want to destroy Ukraine? Why does the devil want to capture Kiev? And I feel the <clears throat> voice, my voice is doing better. Yes, yes, yes. The Jews, yes. in World War II, the Jews in, in Kiev, one out of every four people in Kiev was a Jew. When every, okay, when we, if we go to the Holy Spirit is leading me to, uh, I've never preached this message before. Go with me to the book of Daniel to the last chapter, the 12th chapter of Daniel. This scripture comes to my mind. But I'm, I'm going to try to get out of here if I do, okay? I'm not going to get too carried away. Okay, now, Daniel, the 12th chapter, the first verse, and at that time, the time of the end, shall Michael stand up, the great prince, the great angel, the great archangel. What is, what is Michael's job? What is his official position in heaven? The great prince, God says, which stands for the children of, of thy people. There shall be a time of trouble such as there was since there was a nation... Even at that same time, and at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. So at the end, there's going to be great revival among the Jews. And a lot of Jews, their names are going to be found written in the book of life because they're going to turn to Jesus during the tribulation period. But Michael's job, Michael, every time he's mentioned in the Bible, it's like in the book of Jude, in the book of Daniel, here three or four times. And I think maybe six times he's mentioned in the Bible, five or six times. Every time his job is protecting Jewish people. His job, the Bible says here, the job of Michael is to defend every Jew in the world. That's his job. There is some kind of an archangel over the nation of America. And his job is to promote the kingdom of God in America. The devil has set up his kingdom of darkness to, to reflect, to mirror the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. So the devil has his hierarchy of demons, and you can see that even in Daniel, the 10th chapter, and the head demon over the nation of, of Persia, the head demon, all these scriptures keep coming through, the head demon over the country of Iran, Persia, Daniel is praying for understanding to this revelation. He's fasting. 21 days he's fasting. And finally, an angel comes to him and he says, 
From the first day that you began fasting, I was sent. But the head demon over the kingdom of darkness, over the, the devil's work, over Persia, he, the head demon came and stood against me. And Michael, the great archangel, he came and delivered me. Why? Because Michael's job is to defend Jews. When we were trying to get the big cathedral, our church building Kiev, <clears throat> the KGB had come and, and closed us down. And, well, right before that, the, uh, uh, there was a guy who was the mayor of Kiev, and he wanted the people to like worship him. So he made a beautiful statue. Excuse me. Lost a pen. I don't know if that's mine or where it came from. Stepping on it. He made a, a, a big, giant, beautiful statue of the, of the Archangel Michael. Hmm. And he put it in downtown Kiev. He used vast amounts of tax money to build that big, giant statue of Michael, the Archangel. And so he, he puts this inscription at the bottom of it. The people of Kiev who love their mayor so much gave this beautiful maid and created this beautiful statue of Michael the Archangel to, to show the mayor how much they love him. Well, <laughs> people found out how much money had been spent on that big old giant bronze statue and this like tax money had been, you know, the mayor had used it to, you know, they made this for me because I'm such a great mayor. But why was this Michael Archangel Put in downtown Kiev because Kiev was a Jewish city. Kiev was a Jewish city and the devil did not what? So that mayor was kicked out. A new mayor was put in, Omelchenka, who said, Yeah, I'll sign the documents for you to build that church. So because of the Archangel Michael statue, the mayor was taken out. A new mayor was put in who's a uh, brother had gotten saved in my ministry. Yes. Whenever I, his his uh, his niece, his only niece Anya, who was my personal, she had gotten saved. She became uh, my our a church secretary. And when she got married, I preached her wedding, and she married my head translator. Lo and they've they been living for years out in in Phoenix. We helped them get to Phoenix and to immigrate many years ago. But the mayor came to the wedding. I preached the wedding. It's like, but all God did that because Kiev is and was, was and is a Jewish city. There's still thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews there. Of course the devil wants to destroy. Of course Putin wants to destroy Kiev. Now, here's another scripture that comes to my mind. Go to the book of Matthew with me. But the 23rd chapter of Matthew, Jesus comes in front of the temple and he, he's telling the people, you hypocrites, you hypocrites, you, 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 you won't lift your finger to help somebody get to heaven. And you're finally, he says, you're a generation of snakes. A and, and then he finally gets down to how can you escape the damn, look at the 33rd verse of the 23rd chapter. You serpents, you snakes, you generation of snakes. How can you escape the damnation of hell? You're hypocrites, you're sepulchers, you're all dead on the inside. Right. Then the 37th verse, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, him that killed the prophets and kills the prophets and stones them which are sent to you. How often would I gather your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Your temple is... He's, Jesus is standing in front of the temple. He said, this temple, I have come to you. I've healed thousands. I've raised people from the dead. You won't repent. You won't change. You hate me. You want to destroy everything that I have been sent to do. So I'm leaving this temple. I will never be back to this temple. Look, it says, where I said, ye shall not see me henceforth. I will not be back to this temple Till you shall say, till the Jewish nation, till the Jewish government says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord revealed to me, people want to know, Philip, why is this war taking place? Because God told the Jews, until the Jewish people repent, 
I am not coming back to Jerusalem this, at the end of the seven year tribulation period, the glorious appearing when he comes up. He says, I will never be back till the Jews repent. Well, why would he not allow all of this pressure on Kim? Because there are still hundreds of thousands of Jews there who need to know the name of Jesus. And they're getting saved. And my son is helping. He's translated for 5,000 people. God wants Kiev. God is going to bring Kiev to its knees because it's full of Jews who he, he says, I'm not coming back until you repent. Benjamin Netanyahu, the, the president, prime minister of Israel. He's from Ukraine. He's Jewish. So all of this, these are end times. Because why is the pressure being put um, by Putin onto Kiev? Because God said, you Jews, not just the Jews in Israel, the Jews all over the world. And Kiev, there are a vast amount of Jews in Kiev, in Ukraine. God is on the move, folks. We are nearing the end. Jesus is coming back. There are a few things. Is the, fact, the, the, the phrase, there is nothing left prophetically to be fulfilled, is incorrect. There's not much, but there's still a couple of Israeli wars that are coming up. And what? Well, I can't just stay down there. All right. In Jeremiah, the 49th chapter, Jeremiah, the 49th chapter, beginning with the 34th verse. <clears throat> the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Guess what country we're talking about? Elam. Elam is western Ukraine. Now, I'm going to give you all, all homework sign today. This afternoon when you get home. You know what? Western Ukraine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, I said Ukraine. Okay, I'm sorry. Western Iran. Okay, thank you. I stand corrected. And you see why you have to have a... Behind every man is a better woman. <laughs> Sometimes, I know, Brother Mike, on my preacher recordings, and a guy translated the message uh, last week is over to one. As a matter of fact, it's over to two. We talked on the phone. We'll be, be done here in uh, about a week. It'll be done. And he was, he was somewhere on there, I think maybe you had corrected it. I said something about, uh, I don't remember what country I was talking about, but it was the wrong country. So people all the time have to correct me on all those things. Okay. <clears throat> but this is talking about Elam, which is western Iran. Okay, and what I want you to do today is your homework. I want you to get on the internet and call up a map, Google a map of western Iran, of Elam, ancient Elam, and find out the borders of Elam. Now, the reason it's important is because there's getting ready to be a war there. It's impossible to know when. It could be as early as this August. Remember, we had the birth pangs, the birth pain of COVID. And now, before COVID is over, we have war in Eastern Europe. And now, it's almost time for the next birth pain, which it might be this, it might be something else. But they're coming faster and faster, and they're going to get more and more violent. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of England, e Elam. Now, I know Brother Mike is, a, is a, an avid hunter. When I go to the woods, I love getting out early and going to the woods with these hunters, and I'm just sitting there enjoying the weather, enjoying this like. Bundled up, it's like it's so good to be out here. Lord, what do you have to say to me? I'm not a hunter. I am not a hunter. I will never be a hunter. Okay, <clears throat> but what is a bow? What is a bow? It's a weapon. Is it considered like a shield? Is it defensive or is it offensive? A bow is an offensive letter, a weapon. Oh, divine inspiration. What does a bow do? It launches an arrow. That's thought. Never hurt. I never thought about that before. A bow launches an arrow. God said here, I will break the bow of Elam. I will break the, the, the weapons 
that launch the nuclear weapons. I will break their launch pad sites. I will destroy the launch pad sites. You see, and I was Googling, I was on the internet trying to find out what's going on with Iran, uh, how long it will be, maybe before the war takes place, and everything is about this. And a lot of propaganda about <coughs> the, uh, uh, the Iranian uh, negotiations, <coughs> about the nuclear program to allow them to start again, and couldn't find anything. But this, this is what I do know. A year ago, over a year ago, excuse me, it was last fall, Israel raised a bunch of tax money, over a billion dollars of new taxes for one purpose, to have a war with Iran. Israel also has bought three large planes from America <clears throat> that they have, and these planes will refuel Israeli planes in the air. Now, back in 1973, around there, Saddam Hussein in Iraq was building a nuclear plant, a large nuclear plant. Everything was in one location. Everything was above ground. So Israel had the daunting problem of flying all the way over there and getting their planes back to destroy that nuclear site. Well, they had a problem because they didn't have any way to refuel the planes in the air. Well, now Iran, you know, Israel destroyed the nuclear plant in Iraq. And so Iran has built their nuclear program to not make the same mistakes that Iraq made. Iran has put all of their nuclear program underground in a hundred different locations. Their largest facilities are in the ancient land of Elam, close to the Persian Gulf. The ancient land of Elam. <clears throat> now what did God say he's going to do? He says, I am going to use the Jews and I'm going to destroy the bows. I'm going to destroy the launch pads for the weapons for the nuclear weapons that Iran is building. Last fall, I think it was December, no, it was November, <clears throat> Iran had enough heavy water to start making its first large nuclear weapon. We're not talking about atomic bombs like dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II or in Japan, the end of the war. We're talking about huge weapons, okay? To make the nuclear weapon, you have to have heavy water. Our water we drink is H2O. Two hydrants, two atoms of hydrogen with one atom of oxygen. To make a nuclear weapon, you have to have H3O, three atoms of hydrogen for one atom of oxygen. To make, to make heavy water, you have to have uranium. Uranium enrichment. The uranium has to, that's why the, they shouldn't be building all these nuclear plants. Well, we're doing it for peaceful purposes. Yeah, all right. Uh -huh. Yeah, all right. And uh, <clears throat> got some swamp land in Florida. I'll be glad to sweat this out, okay? <clears throat> so, as of last November, they had plenty of heavy water now to build the first or second large nuclear weapon. So, Israel knows they cannot wait very long. Soon and very soon, I, Iran probably already has a nuclear weapon now, but they don't have the launch pad. They don't have the launch rockets that can deliver that to Israel. Maybe they don't have the nuclear weapon done yet, but they're very, very close. You've heard the, <clears throat> the Israeli government again and again and again, they've made the statement, we will never allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon because they will use it. One large nuclear bomb dropped on Tel Aviv or Jerusalem will destroy all of Israel. It's just the size of the state of New, New Jersey. It is a small country. Okay, one nuclear bomb will kill all the Jews. It'll kill five million Jews that live there. <clears throat> Israel can't allow it to happen. So Israel is going to hit Iran soon and very soon in Saudi Arabia and in Kuwait and Qatar. These other countries, they're just as afraid of Iran as, as other countries because you have the Shiite and the Sunni Muslims that are against each other. <clears throat> so he says, I will break the bow, the launch pad of the Iranians, the chief of their might, means their largest weapons. 
In other words, their largest weapons, their most powerful weapons, are the atomic weapons. And I, God says, I'm going to destroy their largest weapons. I'm going to destroy their launch pads. And upon Elam will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and will scatter them toward all those winds. And there shall be, listen, and there shall be no nation whether the outcast of Elam will not come. Why are the inhabitants of western Iran going to have to flee from western Iran? What's going to cause them? God says, so that means we're going to have Elamites. We're going to have Iranians living here in Oklahoma. Living, he said there won't be one country in the world where millions of Iranians will not be fleeing. Why? What are they trying to escape from? Radiation. Radiation. Okay. <clears throat> Listen, let me read it again now that you know what, what's being said here. <clears throat> he said, there shall be no nation where the outcast of Elam shall not come. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, before Israel, and before them that seek their life. And I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, saith the Lord. And I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. And I will set my throne. You know, the seven-year tribulation is going to be over. And uh, he says, I will set my throne in Elam, and I will destroy from this the king and the princes, saith the Lord. I really don't know exactly what that phrase means. I'm going to destroy the leaders from inside Ukraine. Or, excuse me, Iran. Okay? So maybe Saudi Arabia, Israel, they're going to occupy areas of, of, of Elam, of western Iran, to go in there and and destroy the underground sites. Maybe they won't. Their weapon. They don't have enough bunker busters. And, and Israel has developed new bunker busters. I mean, the Jews are just brilliant. How the, Do you know most of the new technology in all the world is all coming out of Israel? It's all Jews. And you look at the people who have created the internet. All this. They're all Jews. They're all Jews. Yeah. Yeah. Folks. Very soon, this is going to take place. It could take place as early as August. We're talking about in a month. It could be a couple of years. But friends, Israel cannot wait very long because Iran basically has their nuclear weapons or just about. They haven't finished the launch. They haven't finished the, the, uh, the rockets to carry. The nuclear weapons are not little cruise missiles. They're heavy, heavy bombs. And they have developed a system to launch it, to get it to destroy Israel. So very soon, one morning, you'll wake up and, and Western Iran is going to be devastated. The news will supplant everything that's going on in Ukraine and Russia. People have asked me again, when the war started, People have asked me again and again, Philip, is it going to be nuclear war? Is it going to be nuclear war? Is it going to be nuclear war? I say, no, no, not between Russia and the West. No, not now. The Bible is very plain. As over the prophecy is very plain. The war between Russia and America takes place after the rapture. After the rapture. And then Russia will launch its nuclear war against Israel. And that's where America gets involved in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Ezekiel 38 and 39, it's not Armageddon, it's World War III that takes place after the rapture. <clears throat> and I preached here three years ago, September, two and a half years ago, and I said, I explained what God had revealed. Most likely, we don't know exactly when the Lord's going to come. Here's some, a few little statistics. <clears throat> there are three main Jewish calendars. One of them shows that the second coming of the Lord will be like in 150 to 200 years. Another is another crazy day. But there's one of the calendars that I believe 100% is correct, and I had a Jewish rabbi heard him talk about it in 1999. And what that calendar says, that in 2033, it will be 6,000 years since God created the world. Adam and Eve and all that. 2033 will be be 6,000 years. In 2033, it will be 2,000 years since Jesus died on the cross. There will be a seven-year tribulation period if, if the, the glorious appearing, appearing were to take place 
in 2033, seven years earlier, would be the, the, the rapture of the church just before the seven year tribulation period begins. That would put the rapture in 2026 in four years. Through three years ago, I preached. It's like, this is what the Lord showed me. It is, I'm going to say, over a 95% chance we're looking at the, the fall because the rapture has to take place. See the, the seventh beast of Israel? They all deal with the first and second comings of Jesus. And there's a natural side to each of the feasts. There's a spiritual side and there is a prophetic side. The prophetic side of the first three feasts of, of Passover and Unleavened Bread and First Fruits, the prophetic side, they were their spring feast, and all of it was fulfilled when Jesus came the first time. Pentecost, now we're living, living prophetically under the Feast of Pentecost. And then come, you were there that night when I preached that all these years ago, that we're really looking at 2026. Okay? So the fall feast, they deal with the fall of the year. The fall feast all have to be fulfilled in the fall of the year. The first of the fall feast is Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. And it is prophetic. It is symbolic of the second coming of the Lord. I heard Perry Stone a while back preaching on TV, and he says, it's 100% the rapture will take place on Rosh Hashanah. It's just, and, and, I, and this is something I've been preaching for many, many years, and you remember that night. I remember I was preaching up here, and you and somebody were sitting right here and said, okay, next year, let's have this celebration, because I am told yes. that we had a celebration, and Cosette drew a picture uh, when it came, it was going to be six years, most likely six years to the rapture, and we had a, a rapture party at our, our house, and you said, well, next year, let's have it here, and of course, you know, COVID came, and then, the, but it was on a Saturday. Well, now we're looking at, okay, Rosh Hashanah always takes place between the Feast of Trumpets between September 5th and October 5th because God, to keep Israel out of idolatry, He would not allow them to keep track of time by the sun because that's, that's all involved with devil worship, idol worship. So He made Israel keep track of time by the moon, all right? So Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, which is symbolic of the rapture, takes place every year between September 5th and October 5th. So that tells us whatever year the rapture takes place, whether 26 or some other year, it has to take place between September 5th and October 5th. All right? One thing I do know, 100%, God spoke to me years ago, that the nuclear war between the United States and Russia, when Russia comes against Israel, you can read Ezekiel 38 and 39 and, and Joel and Zechariah. The nuclear war that takes place in that war will be on November 11th. Why November 11th? Because that was the day that the Mayflower Compact came into effect when the pilgrims on the Mayflower made a compact. Christians and non-Christians a lot, non-Christian soldiers made a compact that they would build a nation under God. And that's what they start. But the 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 uh, call the people who were colonizing Virginia, Jamestown, oh, they were for slavery and all these things. But the Pilgrims were against slavery. And even when a, a slave ship came to Plymouth Rock to sell their slaves, you know what the Pilgrims did? They arrested all the sailors and set all the slaves free. They said, no, we will not have slavery. This is a nation under God. This is to be a city set on the hill. So what happened to America because of the Pilgrims? All of the northern states were against slavery. And because of the Jamestown people from the Church of England in Virginia, all of the southern states were forced for slavery. That's what caused the Civil War. The preachers, the preachers, the, the pilgrims were saying no, no, no to slavery. And the Jamestown Church of England were saying yes, yes, yes. Now we have the Pentecostals and the Baptists who are saying no, no, no to homosexuality. No to the gay movement. No to woke. No to no, 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 no. no. It makes me sick teaching school. And I look and the boys go, oh, I identify as a girl today. And they go into the bathroom with the girls. It's sick. It's abomination. And now our country people are beginning to wake up and say no. No, this is wrong. Don't be afraid, Christians, to stand up. I've been fighting for four years in the school where I'm at, telling them, no, I'm against it. It's wrong. It's not going to be in my classroom. Amen. 
I sit in the middle school day after day, and I watch the middle school boys. They get on the floor, they're laying on top of each other, kissing each other, and I'm getting, get off. But the other teacher, she's woke. It's okay. She, she's gone. Okay? We have to take a stand. So the Pentecostals are saying, yes, 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 yes. And you go to the, Pente to the Presbyterians, some of the Presbyterians, to the Methodists, the Episcopalian, those churches, and they've got us. They've got the, the, the rainbow signs, all the homosexuals, you're welcome here. You see, we have a division in this country, just like from the beginning. You've got God's people, like the Beams of Light Tabernacle, and then you've got other churches who don't even know Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Folks, it's almost over. Your children and grandchildren who are lost, it's almost over. The rapture's coming. Things are going to get worse. The birth pangs Jeremiah talked about are going to get closer and closer and more and more violent. You're going to wake up one morning, you'll wake up, and, and a million people will have died in one day. The birth pangs are going to be more violent. We are going to be shocked at the things that are around the horizon. I had a, a dream years ago of a 200, well over 200 foot high uh, tsunami that wiped out the west coast of the United States. I heard Perry Stone talk more than once. He said, I had a dream, I've had these dreams of an earthquake that took place off the coast of the Canary Islands towards Africa. And that tsunami, it created a tsunami that came out and it wiped out the east coast of the United States. Where has all of this stuff come from? The coast. And you think God's asleep, church? You think He doesn't hear your prayer? You think He doesn't know what's going on in the United States of America and every country in the world? He knows this is still His country. And he's, this God is not through with the United States. He's not through with our nation. He has, she looks, do not lose hope in our God. He will never fail you. He has never failed. He won't fail now. He'll never fail you or your family or your children because He's not a man. He's God. And this country, our country, is going to pay the cost for walking away from God. There's a high cost to be paid for aborting 63 million babies. But I'm telling you, who, my son, he was saying, Daddy, I would have never, never believed that Rover, my son, I told our children, they hate abortion. He says, I would have, before he left and got on that plane to fly to, to uh, Warsaw, he said, Daddy, I would have never believed that Roe versus Wade would have been overturned. He said, now I believe anything's possible, Daddy. The things you've been preaching, he said, I believe it's possible, Daddy. I had my doubts, but it's possible because Jesus, said, if he can overturn Wade versus, what, Roe versus Wade, she looked. It's a victory for our side. But now we need to stand up and start fighting. Do you know that Oklahoma has the strictest abortion law now in the United States? The strictest. You, no woman can get an abortion except to, even for rape. If you have two, and this is sorry, this is sad, but if you have two little babies that are born, and one of them was born through a loving family, and the other through a rape, this is the one that was formed through rape. Does that baby deserve to die? Because of, as sad as that is, it's sad because babies could be given up to adoption. But don't kill the babies. We were at uh, IHOP in uh, Oklahoma City a few nights ago, and all these women came on. It was on July 4th. They all came in. My body, my, what was, what the, my body, my choice, written on their shirts, written on their, on, on their shirts. Uh, a bunch of white girls. And one of them came in, my body is not an incubator. That's what was written on her stomach, on the shirt. Folks, it's time that we as Christians quit being silent. Your time, he said, work while it is yet day, for night cometh when no man can work. The night is almost here. The inspiration that I felt almost three years ago, the last time I was here, it's even more powerful now. It's stronger now. This, the Azobin prophecy that I gave in 2007, and I said, and I'm going to close. He, and when God told me, he came down, he spoke to me five hours one night. He said, Russia is going to invade Ukraine, and you have to warn the Ukrainians. He said, I've spoke to other 
people, other men of God to share this. They've all refused, so you'll have to do it by yourself. So I organized this day. I made 13 videos and pictures of the things that God had shown me. I preached two hours and 40 minutes that, you, that Russia is going to invade Ukraine. They will conquer Ukraine over to the Dnieper River. There were so many death threats on social media. He ended up preaching that in high, I've thought so many times down in Skadovsk. It's in Kherson. They don't say it. How do they say it on the news? Kherson? Kherson something? It's called Kherson. Okay. I preached the third time. A church says, we've heard it. And we've got about 250 people. We'll put you up in a hotel if you'll come and preach us over here. So we took the train down. And... <clears throat> Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, and Sunday morning, I preached to Zobna and warned them the Russians are coming. All that area now is in the hands of, the Kherson is all in the hands of Russians. And the translator, after the war started eight years ago, the lady who translated for me in that conference, she contacted me after the war started in 2013, early 2014. She said, Pastor Philip, she said, I remember Scudos. I remember I translated for you for three days. Hour after hour, hour after hour, you preached. She said, I did my best. But I stood there in front of that vast crowd. I stood there and I thought, this is impossible. Russia will never touch Ukraine. How could this man of God be saying that God told him to warn Ukraine that Russia is coming and that all Jews are to get out of eastern Ukraine? Everybody who's born again and you don't want to lose your property, get out of eastern Ukraine. The Russians are coming. She said, I didn't believe it. I translated everything accurately, but I didn't believe it. But now, she said, the war has started. I apologize that I did not believe the word in the prophet of God's mouth. Folks, these things are coming. Believe the word of the Lord. He cannot strike. Amos 5 and 3, what, 3 and 5. God says, I cannot strike. I cannot bring us without first warning through my prophets. Folks, the end is coming. Jesus is coming for us. God bless you, brother Mike. Thank you for letting us come.